Hi everyone. This is lecture 32 on our first lecture on the reproductive system. In this lecture, we'll begin with the male reproductive system. And then in subsequent several lectures, we'll cover the female reproductive system. So we'll begin with a brief coverage of the gross anatomy of the male reproductive system. And we'll, discover, we'll discuss the major organs and structures. Then we'll talk about um, uh, spermatogenesis and spermiogenesis. We'll talk about the effect of testosterone. And we'll talk about the, the different glands of, uh, uh, that secrete fluids uh, for normal functioning. So let's begin with the anatomy of the male reproductive system. The testes produce sperm that travel through the ducts and, and, and semen produced by the accessory glands. So what does this tell you? That the major sperm farming organ are the testes, and they travel through a series of ducts, which we'll talk about, in a fluid called semen that are secreted by accessory glands in the male reproductive system. Okay, the testes or testicles are located in the scrotum. So they're here in the diagram. They're uh, they're externally located. So it's, Optimal sperm production is at slow, slightly lower than normal body temperature in the sac called the scrotum, and here are the testes. Uh, connective tissue divides them into different lobules, and each lobule contains the coiled seminiferous tubules, and this is the site for sperm production. Okay, so you can here see that in the testes are these coiled tubes of the seminiferous tubules that are separate out the different lobules. This is have two functions. The one, the first major one that we talked about is to produce sperm. The second is also the androgen hormones, primarily testosterone. And these are going to help regulate sperm production and also the male sexual characteristics. The seminiferous tubules contain two types of cells. The spermatogenic or sperm forming cells and also another type of cell called the tentacular cells, which have several functions, such as producing testicular fluid. They help take care of also the cells, uh, developing cells. The testicular fluid has nutrients for, for sperm. Okay, so in this diagram, we see uh, a seminiferous tubule. There's the lumen in the middle here. You can see the sperm developing here. Uh, we see the uh, Sustentacular cells, uh, the spermatogenic cells, okay, and developing sperm cells. So I made you a little handy dandy table here of the seminiferous tubules showing the two different types of cells. Uh, the interstitial or lydic cells that are between the seminiferous tubules, and that produces so mostly androgens, uh, uh, then mostly testosterone, and myoid, myoid cells, as, as the name implies. There are muscle-like cells surrounding the seminiferous tubules. And these help contract and push sperm and fluid through the tubules. Okay, here are the myoid cells and the interstitial cells. Now, the seminiferous tubules merge into a single straight tube moving sperm into a, into a structure called the red testes. The red testes is a network of tubules on the posterior testes. And then the sperm passes through the efferent ductule. Okay, so here's a straight tubule, and then it goes to the red testis to the efferent tubules, where they extend toward the epididymis. Now, we mentioned that the male reproductive system is, has a duct system, and so we're going to see that from the seminiferous tubules, the sperm travels to the epididymis. Uh, which is a long uh, tube, about six meters that allows sperm to mature and store it for several months. Any sperm that's not ejaculated or resorbed and located on the severe posterior surface of the testes. Okay. So here are the ductus epididymis. And then sperm move from different areas of the epididymis from the head to the body to the tail of the epididymis. So here's the uh, body. Uh, head and the tail. Then we go to the ductus deferens. 
which is the one area of the ductus epididymis. And it extends through a, 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 a spermatic cord that can also contains arteries, veins, and nerves. And, and so here you see the spermatic cord where the ductus deferens extends into. And it also includes arteries and also uh, veins and also nerves. The vast deferens I mean, uh, uh, extends in the spermatic cord and enters the public cavity through the inguinal canal, which is the passive way to the through the abdominal wall. Okay. So in this diagram here, you can see the uh, the spermatic cord entering uh, the inguinal canal. The duchess deferens passes along the lateral side of the bladder, over the ureter, and along the posterior bladder, uh, and contains pseudostratified columnar epithelium, which is the urinary system, and it enters and it extends a wide area of the ampulla. Okay, so here is the ductus deferens extending over the urinary bladder, and here is the ampulla, right here. Okay. The duct deferens contains three layers of smooth muscle, an inner longitudinal, an outer longitudinal, and a middle circular. Okay. And during ejaculation, ejaculation these muscles squeeze, moving the sperm along. Then we get, go to the ejaculatory duct. Uh, 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 the sperm move next to the ejaculatory duct. Okay. And this is the junction of the ampulla and the duct of the seminal vesicle. And the seminal vesicle is the very first uh, accessory gland we come to. Okay. Each ejaculatory duct travels to the prostate gland and empties into the urethra. Okay. So here's the seminal vesicle right here. Okay. Here's the ampulla. Joins together into an ejaculatory duct, and then it passes through the into the uh, inside the prostate gland. The urethra contains the urinary bladder at. at, at connects the urinary bladder to the external body surface. In the male, it, it, it moves both urine and semen, and it's much longer in the male, about 18 to 20 centimeters, and soon muscle contracts during ejaculation. It also contains mucus secreting glands that contribute to the semen, and it's composed of three parts. There's a prostatic urethra that's surrounded by the prostate gland, there's a membranous urethra that passes through the external urethral sphincter, and there's a spongy urethra that passes through the penis and ends at the external urethral orifice. Okay, so here again the, we have the prostatic urethra, the short membranous urethra, and the longer spongy urethra, and all three are parts of the of the urethra, male urethra. Uh, the penis delivers sperm into the female reproductive tract. And so it is the male copulatory organ. Uh, it connects to the pubic bones. Uh, it enlarges at, at the end, called the glans penis. And uh, it's covered by a preface or foreskin that's usually uh, removed during the circumcision. Okay. So here is the root, here's the, the body, and here's the gland penis. And there's the preface covering the glans penis. Uh, the penis itself is contains three cylindrical erectile bodies or corpora. Each corpora has a smooth muscle filled with vascular spaces that engorges the blood. Okay. In the penis, there's the pericorpora cavernosa, and the third is the ventral corpus spongiosum. And during sexual assignment, vascular spaces filled with blood, which causes an erection. Okay. So here in the, in the cross section, we see the pericorpora cavernosa and the uh, single corporate, corporate spongiosum with the spongy urethra passing through it. So the dorsal arteries supply the skin, fascia, and corporate spongiosum. Uh, the deep arteries supply the corpora cavernosa, and the spongy urethra is within the, the corporate spongiosum as we mentioned. Okay. And so both the penis and scrotum make up the external male genitalia. Uh, the male perineum is between the thigh bordered by the pubic symphysis, atrial tuberosities, and the coccyx. Uh, the 
we mentioned uh, briefly the accessory sex glands, and each of these produces a lucid portion of semen. Okay. And so the, uh, uh, the fluid expelled during ejaculation lubricates the penis during intercourse, and it includes uh, the, the, the seminal vesicle, the prostate gland, and the bulbal urethral gland. Okay. Let's look at the seminal vesicles first. These are paraglands on the posterior surface of the urinary bladder. We mentioned them already. Okay, here's the seminal vesicle right here, and here's the seminal vesicle right here, <clears throat> right parallel to the ampulla. The, the, the ducts converge with ductus, the ductus deferens to form the ejaculatory ducts, and pseudostratified collaminal epithelium secretes the seminal fluid. Okay, so here's the ejaculatory duct where the, where the uh, ductus deferens and the seminal vesicle join together. Uh, its secretion is a, a yellowish seminal fluid and composes the majority of the semen volume, about 60 to 70 percent. And the composition of seminal fluid includes fructose, which is a nutrient to make help uh, uh, make ATP, uh, prostaglandins, which contracts smooth muscle and increases sperm viability, and coagulating proteins and enzymes, which forms a clot of semen in the female rep reproductive tract. So the sperm is not, you know, lost. The prostate gland is an excess gland inferior to the urinary bladder surrounding the urethra and the ejaculatory ducts. Okay. So during ejaculation, spoon muscle squeezes secretions into the prostatic duct, and uh, milky secretions produces about 23, 20 to 30% of the semen volume. Now, uh, <clears throat> the, the prostatic secretions are alkaline to help neutralize acids from the urethra, and also to counteract the acids in the female reproductive tract. So here's the prostate gland <clears throat> uh, with the prostatic urethra passing through it. Now here's the composition of prostatic secretion. It's citrate, which is also a substrate the sperm uses to make ATP. It has prostatic specific antigen enzymes, which helps dissolve the semen clot, allowing sperm to move deeper into the femur reproductive tract. It also contains antimicrobial chemicals, which inhibit bacterial growth to decrease infection. And the, the prostate gland uh, may enlarge with age. Okay, a, 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 it's common, a, a common uh, uh, to have a benign prostate hyperplasia, which is a non-cancerous, but expand pushing against the urethra, making ur urination you know, more difficult. Uh, and an enlarged prostate may be secondary to prostate cancer. So oftentimes, uh, prostate can be removed. And treated with surgery, radiation therapy, or chemotherapy. The third accessory gland is the bulbar urethral gland, also known as the Cowper's glands. And these are at the base of the penis on either side of the membranous urethra. So these are the smallest ones right here. Okay, these produce a thick, thick alkaline mucus-like fluid in response to sexual stimulation. So its function is to neutralize acidic urine remaining prior to ejaculation, and also lubricates the urethra for ejaculation. Now, collectively, uh, the fluid is called semen, which is a mixture of sperm and fluid from the testes, seminal vesicles prostate, and bulbar urethral gland. Uh, sperm itself contributes to about 5% of the semen's total volume. Each ejaculate is about 2.5 to 5 meals. It contains 40 to 750 million sperm. And then within the semen volume, uh, five, we said 5% is constant sperm. Most of it's from the seminal vesicle, and the next amount is the prostate gland. And the bulbar urethral gland is up to four mils, but it's, this is not necessarily part of the semen volume, but may be secreted continuously. And so here's the summary of the uh, um, uh, male uh, reproductive uh, system and the accessory glands. Now let's look at the uh, male reproductive system physiology. So we're going to begin with spermatogenesis and hormonal control. Okay. So in lab, you, you talked about meiosis. 
Okay, and we're just going to limit our discussion to to spermatogenesis. Okay, so if you need to re re review uh, myelosis, you might have to. You should do that. Spermatogenesis is sperm cell development, which begins at puberty. Okay, and this occurs in the seminiferous tubules and begins with uh, cells called the spermatogonia. Now, spermatogonia are diploid, meaning they have a full complement of chromosomes, 46 chromosomes, and they're found along the basement membrane. And prior to puberty, puberty spermatogonia only divide by mitosis. Okay. So here they're showing the basement membrane here, and here you're showing the sperm, uh, spermatogonia undergoing spermatogenesis. At puberty, mitosis continues, but some spermatogonia become primary spermatocytes. And primary spermatocytes are diploid. Okay. Primary spermatocytes also push toward the lumen of the seminiferous tubules. So as they mature through spermatogenesis, they're going to be moving toward the lumen of the, each seminiferous tubule. So here's the lumen here, where the more mature uh, sperm are forming. Okay. So here is spermatogonia undergoing mitosis to produce the diploid primary spermatocytes. Now, each primary spermatocyte undergoes a first meiotic division, meiosis 1. And, and as a result of meiosis 1 are two smaller haploid cells called secondary spermatocytes. So secondary spermatocytes are haploid. Okay. So here we show uh, a meiosis 1 occurring from the primary spermatocytes producing the haploid secondary spermatocytes. Okay. Uh, as a result, two secondary spermatocytes then complete the second meiotic division to produce four haploid spermatids. So we have the four haploid spermatids. Okay. So here's a summary of the genetic state of the male and the male cells. Remember, spermatogonia and primary spermatocytes are both diploid while secondary spermatocytes and spermatids are both haploid, as will be the mature sperm. Now let's talk about some of the other cells uh, that we mentioned earlier. Uh, so statacular cells, you know, they're also known as nurse cells or Sertoli cells. So you get an idea of their, their function as nurse cells. They're going to help take care of the developing spermatids. So these are supporting cells from the basin membrane to the lumen of tubule kind of assist as, uh, as the maturation occurs. Okay. <clears throat> so here's a cystic here. So no, all of those, the, 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 uh, there's tight junctions forming the blood testis barrier, which is another fu function of the cystic cells. So here's a, a list of the numerous functions of cystic cells. They're there for structural support. They find blood testis barrier. Now you may ask, why do you need a blood testis barrier? But keep in mind that due to uh, the genetic shuffling in meiosis, that the cells, the bony sperm, are now genetically different from the body cells, and so there must be a blood testis barrier so that the immune cells uh, don't stimulate immune response to attack these foreign cells. Now they secrete, secrete testicular fluid to aid in sperm transport. They provide nutrients. They phagocytize damaged spermatogenic cells and excess cytoplasm for spermiogenesis. And they produce antigen binding protein inhibitin that regulates spermatogenesis. So, so cystacular cells do have many functions for spermatogenesis. Now, another process, which kind of sounds like spermatogenesis, is spermiogenesis. And this is the maturation of spermatids. Because remember, uh, uh, spermatids do not look anything like sperm yet. What happens is they elongate, they shed excess cytoplasm, form a head, a midpiece, and a tail uh, called logella. Okay, so here the spermatids are elongating into uh, 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 spermatids during spermiogenesis. Okay, <clears throat> during spermiogenesis, an acrosome forms over a nucleus that assists during fertilization. Okay, and it contains a lysosome that's going to help uh, uh, break up the follicular cells surrounding the uh, egg for fertilization. More mitochondria are formed. 
uh, microtubules form flagellum, and then sperm are released into the semers of tubules. Okay. Of course, they're no lot. They're not modal yet, but they look like that. Now they are the spermatids. <clears throat> so the sperm has a head, midpiece, and tail. They're about 60 micrometers long and 3 micrometers wide. The bin piece contains mitochondria. Flagellum is still non-modal, and this takes about um, uh, 16 to 7 days to complete. Okay, and so here's the a, a process of spermogenesis occurring as it transitions from a spermatid, which looks like a cell, traditional cell, to uh, a, a, a cell that looks more like a sperm. And here's a, a micrograph showing a real sperm. Now let's talk about the hormonal control. Uh, testosterone is controlled by the negative feedback involving the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal uh, axis, also known as the HEPG axis, okay, which we kind of talk extens extensively during the endocrine lecture. Okay, so I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail because this is the same figure that we saw before. Uh, there's different levels of control. The first tier control is the hypothalamic, which releases gonadotropin-releasing hormone, and this enters the anterior pituitary. The second tier control, uh, the gonadotropin-releasing hormone stimulates the secretion of FSH and LH, follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. The third tier control, uh, luteinizing hormone stimulates testosterone production uh, from the interstitial cells. Follicle stimulating hormone uh, stimulates the cystic cells to secrete uh, and, uh, the antigen binding protein. And the effects are that the uh, antigen, androg so androgen binding protein uh, binds testosterone. So let me correct that. It's androgen binding protein. Okay. Testosterone stimulates the spermatogenesis and develops the male characteristics. And you can see as we will discuss repeatedly during the endocrine system that there's negative feedback uh, from the uh, uh, from testosterone to both the anterior pituitary gland and also to the hypothalamus. Now, infertility is, uh, has been classified as an inability to produce pregnancy after one year. And uh, they, they, they estimate that about 40% is due to male infertility. <laughs> and uh, common uh, reasons are low sperm count, less than 15 million sperm per milliliter of semen, or can be due to low hormonal levels, either going to have trouble releasing hormone, luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, or even testosterone. It can also be due to the damage to the testes, such as trauma, radiation, or, or disease. Another uh, disorder is cryptocortism, and uh, during male development, the testes descend normally into the scrotum. However, in cryptocortism, they fail to descend, and as a result, no sperm will be produced. The male sexual response uh, is required for fertilization to occur uh, uh, to, for the sperm to uh, reach the egg. Okay. Normally, it's bisexual intercourse, also called copulation or coitus, and it's defined as the insertion of the penis into the vagina, which is the female re uh, copulatory organ. And there are two phases of the male sexual response: there's the erection and ejaculation. Uh, the first step, erection, is stiffening the penis, allowing, the, allowing it to enter the vagina, and it results when it's engorged with blood, and it's due to a parasympathetic reflex that releases a a, a gas called nitric oxide from endothelial cells that dilates arterioles of the penis. Okay, and it's maintained by compression of veins uh, that drain the penis, so blood cannot be uh, is not you know drained, so that re re uh, re retains an erection. Now, impotence or erectile dysfunction is the inability to maintain erection, and okay? so where the they have uh, drugs like Viagra, for example, um, is due to treat this. The second step is ejaculation, and this is the expelling the semen from the penis. This is under sympathetic control. 
Okay, so to me that's kind of interesting because the erection is parasympathetic, but ejaculation is sympathetic. They're two separate processes. Okay, uh, for example, in the uh, cattle industry or even in the equestrian, when they want to breed horses, a lot of times uh, they, if you have a uh, bull or a stallion, a lot of times they can uh, electrically stimulate uh, to, to obtain uh, sperm. So they could take it to the uh, not, uh, take it to the female rather than bringing the horses together or, or cattle. <clears throat> there are two stages: emission and expulsion. Okay, emission is the movement of sperm and semen into the male urethra. Expulsion is the movement of semen from the urethra, which uh, it, it results from the urethra, which movement of semen from the urethra results from skeletal muscle contraction of the penis. Okay. And the term orgasm refers to the feeling of pleasure experienced when in which in males coincides with ejaculation. Uh, the male sexual response is followed by uh, a resolution in which the blood vessels constrict and the penis becomes flaccid again. And the latent a refractory period occurs in which another orgasm cannot be achieved. Now, testosterone has effects on other body systems, and these are called secondary male characteristics. And it's single that during puberty. So during childhood, uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone is inhibited from the hypothalamus. At puberty, it is, stimulates the HPG axis and increases blood testosterone. And testosterone triggers spermatogenesis and the secondary characteristics, which include both sex and somatic characteristics. The sex characteristics include growth of pubic, axillary, uh, chest, and facial hair, a deepening of voice to the large larynx and thicker vocal cords. It's it also responsible for thickened skin and increased sebaceous gland secretion. So these are male secondary sex characteristics. There are also male secondary somatic characteristics, such as denser bone, increased muscle mass, and decreased number of erythrocytes, and also increased libido um, or sexual uh, interest in sexual behavior. Okay. So this concludes uh, the male reproductive system, which we conclude when we finish in one lecture. We're going to find that the female reproductive system is a little more complicated, and it's going to take more than one lecture to complete it. And that'll be the, the next lecture. Thank you.